Hi, I'm John DiNicola, a writer of the songs from Dirty Dancing that I've had the time of my life and Hungry Eyes. You can find my work on omadrecords.com, O-M-A-D records.com or johndinicola.com. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. He, well, he's a musician, he's a producer, he's the owner of an amazing company. He's also an Academy Award winner. So I've had now an Academy Award winner, an Emmy Award winner. All I need is a Grammy and a Tony, and I'll have an EGOT for this particular podcast. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Well, thanks. Uh, we are joined by the ever talented John uh, okay. Nicola. How are you doing? Here we today? go. I'm doing great today. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. I'm John D. Nicola, as we just stated. Uh, you know, I've been music my whole life. My whole life since I was picked up a guitar at eight years old and I was not knowing what to do with my left hand, but I was plucking the strings in the basement. My mom said to my dad, he sounds like he'd be good on guitar. And I, maybe that was all the encouragement I needed. Been pursuing music ever since. At 12 years old, my mom also sent me into my cousin's one stop, one stop for LPs at the time. And she said, yeah, go pick out three LPs. And I picked out Traffic, uh, Mr. Fantasy, Jimi Hendrix, Are You Experienced, and uh, Moby Grape. And that was it for me. I, I was hooked. I was already hooked, really. When I heard Pretty Woman, I was hooked by uh, Roy Orbis. I started with guitar, and then I switched to bass because my friends that I had through junior high school were guitarists, so I picked up the bass. I really studied hard. Having long hair in the 60s, I got pulled over by cops a number of times and I lost my license and it allowed me to shed my electric bass playing for, you know, I played all day, you know, since I couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> and, um, you know, that led to, I, I played in like some cover bands as a kid uh, into my early teens. And then I went to Berkeley College of Music and studied a little more. And while I was there, I got called to do this band called flight flight was a jazz fusion band we were signed to motown records we're talking 78 here so my metamorphosis from rock and pop music into uh kind of fusion you know jazz playing and jazz fusion and then post that i got back into pop music actually erica badu sampled one of our songs from that Motown record for her song back in the day, which was a pretty big hit. And I started getting back to rock music and pop music and led me to meet Frankie Previtt um, through a mutual friend. I had a, a track of music around at that studio that I was working at and Frank was working at it also, you know, not together. And he heard the music and he said, I'd love to write to that. And that song ended up being Hungry Eyes. We wrote Hungry Eyes really for Frankie's. Uh, Frankie was from a band called Frankie and the Knockouts. He had a, a, a few top 20 hits with that band and he lost his record deal and he was looking to gather more material to try and get another record. And we wrote Hungry Eyes that way. Uh, during that time, we got a call from Jimmy Einer, which was his label owner that he had just left or he dissolved the label. And Jimmy was the, the uh, music director for um, the movie Dirty Dancing. You know, that brings me up to date, songwriter for uh, the last uh, 20, 25 years, <laughs> maybe longer, I don't even know. I, I, you lose track at this point. Yeah. The success with Dirty Dancing enabled me to start my own record label. And I have some, you know, few artists on that label that I, everything, just about everything I produce here at my studio. The last piece in the last couple of years started recording my own records as an artist. Nice. So at this uh, stage in my career, I put out two records. I'm working on a third. That wow. brings us up to date. 
I would expect nothing less of a long resume that you have in music to be as wonderfully detailed as you were with that introduction, because I, I don't know what else I could add to that. The musical journey obviously in, inspired your path in your career, and especially living through the decades, I'm sure has been an amazing experience when it comes to just hearing music for the very first time. And then, you know, now 40 some odd years later, it gets a, a recycle to the, yeah. the new listeners. I think that's incredible in its own right. But what's the misconception about the music industry or the creative process of writing music that needs to be understood clear for those that don't follow the industry? Oh, misconception. Well, it's just, I, I don't know. I don't know. It, it has changed. It has changed drastically in some ways. I'm going to say in some ways good, but mostly not good <laughs> uh, as far as getting paid for your music i guess the upside is everybody can sort of record it used to be you had to go into a recording studio and spend months and work on a record and to get it out now you can do it at home on a laptop you know uh, in in some regard you can you know not not in every not every kind of music but a lot of music i guess that would be the upside it's more accessible the downside is streaming is killing the business the spotify's uh, apple plays a pays a drop more but it's still it, it's unsustainable you know if I, if i with my resume I, I i can get 8 million streams a quarter maybe more maybe a little less and, you know that ends up being a few hundred dollars that's for you know for millions of streams you know uh, some new artist who might be excited to get 100,000 streams i you know that that's a good number 200,000 streams, it's a, a couple of bucks. You can't live on that. So, you know, we feel like, I feel like we got in on just under the the bar there uh, when LPs and even CDs were still a thing. I think CDs and LPs are making a minor comeback, but streaming is not a model that, especially as a songwriter, is, is, not, a, is not a model that can be... Uh, sustainable the music industry in general you know it's it's funneled down you know there's a few major labels and it's all that has funneled down to a few and unless you're you know doing an r&b pop thing I, I don't know how you get a record label these days new like a you know like a sony or a universal i don't know how you would i don't know how you do it i think unfortunately you have to show that You've got millions of streams, then maybe they'll come and go. Oh, by the way, we we we'll take it to the next level. You know, it's a tough, tough business. Like I said, the upside is you can do it at home. Maybe you know if you're if you're talented. And the other side of it is, um, if you're into music, it hit me like a lightning bolt as a kid, and you know that it, it's all I wanted to do. And and I don't think that that's changed. I think people. You know, if you're struck like I was and it's in you to create music, write or perform or whatever, you're going to do it. You're going to do it and because you're not going to feel whole unless you do. You just have to hope that it somehow finds its way into a situation. You know, we, we, we stumbled into Dirty Dancing. I mean, we stumbled into it. I was talking about it how many years later. You know, it's a, you just never know. As Eleanor Bergstein, who wrote the movie, uh, at one time we were, I was talking about a project and she said, well, you got to do it. Otherwise, it's definitely not going to happen. Otherwise, you know, I mean, it's, if it doesn't exist, no one really is going to care. <laughs> so, you know, you have to care about it enough yourself to make it happen. Funny, I, I was talking to Stacey Weidlitz uh, a couple of months back, actually, about when he co-wrote uh Oh, yeah. I'm doing the same thing. She's like the wind. Thank you. It was interesting talking about the process of writing music and looking at the iconic songs that, that you've also created. But this industry and these iconic songs just resonate with people. And as a musician yourself, what is it about music that you just keeps you going? Why do you keep creating music? Yeah. You know, it's just uh, it's an amazing feeling to go into a room where there's nothing there. Right. It's, there's, there's nothing. And then you start putting down some ideas. And before you know it, there's a song from, from nothing, from zero. 
there's something new in the world. You know, maybe some people will care to hear. It's a great, especially lately, since I've had this, my own studio here, I have, I, I, I love to play every instrument. I have piano, I have a, a Hammond organ, I have guitars, I have a marimba, I have, I just picked up some flutes and I just have a blast. And it, it just feels so good when you start something and when you finish it it's i don't know i don't know of any other thing that feels that good to me you know it, it's just well you know i mean i'm yeah. getting that but you know what i'm saying yeah it's a um it's just a unique feeling it's it's sort of euphoric kind of life affirming <laughs> you know <laughs> what is a lesser known aspect of your songwriting or creative process that fans might find intriguing okay my my approach is uh, stream of consciousness. I I don't. There's not a lot of thought. I don't sit down and go and think about what I'm playing. I just play stuff. It's almost like a uh, something. I I I guess you you spend years listening to music and taking in music, and it gets mixed around in your head, and and then it just comes back out you know it spills back out more so as i get older i my first instinct of whether it's a writing a song or playing a guitar part whatever my, my first instinct is the one i go go yeah that's great and then i go well let me make it better but i you know a lot of times i can't mm -hmm. and that's you know with a song I, i'll just sit whether it's a keyboard or um a guitar and Within minutes, I have a something I can work with. I can continue to work on Hungry Eyes, for instance. And this is going back a ways, of course. But musically, I was playing on a Roland Juno 106. And I started playing that song musically, not lyrically, but musically and partly melodically, played itself down in 10, 10 15 minutes. I had that musical chord structure and melodies dun, dun, dun. i had all that it was i've heard other songwriters talk about this the same thing where it's almost like a channeling something you know it's not it's not there's no consciousness to it it's just like it's something funnels through you so that's what i would say i i would say uh first instincts and um not a whole bunch of thought, you know, it, Hungry Eyes, again, as it played itself down, I realized later it, it's, it modulates keys with, from the, ver from the beginning of the chorus to the verse, it changes keys. And I, there was no way I was thinking about it. It just, that's what I heard in my head. And that's what came out. The muse of music struck again. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it's a great song. It still holds up to this day. What is it about the people that you were working with to create this song that just made it all come together. By the way, I, I just redid it on my, my 2019 album, the why, because I redid it in, you know, I didn't want to do it the same way. So I, I redid it with a sort of, a, um, I actually consulted with my son and <laughs> he said, well, a lot of, a lot of modern indie rock bands are pulling on the eighties synth pop and so that's the direction we went that's the direction i went on on my version the music came out of me pretty quickly but then frankie heard that at that studio that we were both working at and he said oh, oh i'd love to write that and uh you know frankie finished that off he put the top line on and as far as that movie went we submitted the time of my life and we'll probably get into that later and then they said, well, we need another song for this other scene. And actually, they brought us in for the scene, I Carried a Watermelon, which ended up being um, Love Man and uh, These Arms of Mine. No, I can't remember what the other one is. Two songs. They said, we need a, a song for this scene. And we played them Hungry Eyes. And they said, well, it's not good for this scene. But we had this other idea. I think, I think it was a combination so Frankie was supposed to sing that. We went in again to talk to the, the director and the, the writer, Eleanor and, and Emil Ardolino. 
when we went in for the third song, Emil, you know, Emil said to us, what's the beats per minute on, on Hungry Eyes? And, and we said, well, we're, we're going in the studio tomorrow to record it. And he goes, oh, oh no, we ha we already have that. That's Eric Carmen is singing that. So that was a surprise to us. You know, I think Eric's adding his voice to that song, the scene in the movie, uh, you know, it's kind of a little menage a trois-ish, the, you know, the, the two dancers are teaching her and, you know, it's a sensual scene, the part where it, it, Patrick's going like this with uh, Jennifer uh, and she starts giggling. That was real. She was started to giggle. Like, and, you know, Patrick was like, come on, you know, and they kept that in. That wasn't supposed to be, <laughs> you know, the the whole movie, The I think um, Hungry Eyes, you know, it's, it's one of the, if I may say so, one of the top moments in the movie and it's it's partly the marriage of the song and the scene that's on the screen without a doubt eric lending his his voice to it and actually he he did the production of it he took our demo and redid it and um you know it's a combination combination of things that i don't know if anybody can put their finger on why anything but you know even dirty dancing you know, why is why are we still talking about it you can't you know it's uh stuff that's comes across through the screen that is unspoken that moves people i think i think hungry eyes was part of that it, it, you know it moved people you know because you know listen that was 87 and that music hungry eyes was from the time it wasn't from 1963 time of my life was pushed a little in that more in that direction our original demo wasn't but you know so you listen to a 1987 song in 1987, that's supposed to be a 1963 song. So, you know, this doesn't seem to affect people or bother people, but I don't know if you can put your finger on it. Well, when you get caught up in, in a movie, when you get really invested in something, you, you lose all track of time. It really doesn't matter right. what what's right. there because you're experiencing the experience. And I think it's incredible. You touched on the fact that you're doing music for yourself these days, but is there any other mediums or art forms that you're working on that inspire your creativity? Well, we're, we're actually, well, you know, besides some music videos from actually two songs that I had on my records, um, one's called She Said, and we actually just won a, an award. My son and his company, him and his uh, partner, Hill, Stedman did uh, a video for my song. She said, and we just, it's been in a, a, a number of uh, film festivals and uh, runner ups and second place or whatever. And it just came in first oh. in the Hawaiian film festival. So we're proud of that. It's a good video. He shot it on 16 millimeter nice. film. And then of course you trans transfer it to digital, but, and then I did another song, uh, another song of mine on the same record uh, called float on hope, which is, kind of about without being preachy it's kind of about global warming through a, a mouse a, the mouse from manaus who and it's animated on this wonderful animator jenna shot and she just oh man she nailed it it took me a long time to find her she did the 2d you know the 2d uh, kind of hand drawn and I, I just love what she did and it's the mouse from manaus uh being the amazon right manaus is an amazon and he has to leave the planet. He has to go find another planet and and settle another planet. And he's he's leaving his mom and he's weeping and it's just a you know she did such a wonderful job and the the tune is like I said it's it's without being preachy it's it's bringing some attention to what I think needs some attention. Yeah. I guess the biggest project we're working on film wise. And it is inspirational. I, I work with an artist. I've done two records on my label, uh, Peter Lewis. Now, Peter Lewis was a founding member of the band Moby Grape. His mother was Loretta Young, who was an Oscar-winning uh, actress. I also worked with Peter's daughter, Arwen Lewis. She came to him at age 25 and said, I, I really want you to teach me guitar and songwriting. And this documentary, it's called Fall on You, which was a famous, well, almost famous, because Moby Grape was one of these bands that influenced a lot of people. I mean, you listen, you know, somebody like Beck or Robert Plant or uh, Little Steven, Chrissy Hind, 
all will say that Moby Grape had a huge influence on them. So Fall on You was a song that Peter wrote with Moby, in Moby Grape. The title, you know, right now we're still editing, but it's it's like an hour, 40 minutes so far. Mm -hmm. It'll get a little shorter, but... You know, it's it's not a typical uh, documentary. It's about a father and a daughter, hopes and between, you know, what, what he was. She came to him and he was thinking because of his experience with Moby Grape, he said, I hope I'm not bringing a, a curse to her, you know, getting her into the music business. And, you know, because he was familiar with fame from his mother, who was a huge, you know, Academy Award winning actress, and he could see how, she struggled with that, you know, a loneliness from even the doc. He talks about even Frank Sinatra. He used to go sell Frank Sinatra Christmas cards or whatever. And, you know, in Beverly Hills. And he said even Frank seemed kind of lonely. And what fame can bring, you know, he has seen firsthand. And so, you know, was he bringing this curse to his daughter by getting her into the music business? It's partly about that. And part of it is is his growing up with in Beverly Hills. And then it goes into the Moby Grape story and then it closes with them doing gigs together and stuff like that. We did a record for Arwen that contained 12 Moby Grape songs. And then when we did that record release in New York City, we, at the bitter end, we played those songs. So there's some footage from that. And so and we're excited about it. We rewatched it my wife and I recently, and we're still yeah. editing. We have an editor, a guy named David Frame, who edited recently the Dave Navarro documentary. And he's all, he was a friend of ours before that. So he's working on the edits. You know, the, the last, my son captured some beautiful footage, kind of Terrence Malick looking, beautiful, beautiful stuff. And uh, this is on the West Coast out in the Santa Barbara area. Kind of opens it up and sets the pace for the quality of the movie. But the last few scenes are so beautiful between a father and a daughter that, uh, you know, we, it's two times we've watched it, we're, you know, start crying. But it was the happy tears. There was just such a beautiful, and there's a DJ in Santa Barbara who brings, you know, he starts crying too, because it's a, it's a beautiful thing to behold, a father and daughter and making music together. I don't know if you happen to know the Moby Grape story, but it is, we could spend four days going down that rabbit hole that'll have to be another interview then <laughs> oh, well, you can interview peter and yeah, yeah. He'll talk about it. but right. boy it is it's quite a story that you know one of the typical 60s 70s management ripoffs they couldn't even perform as moby great because he owned the name and they signed away so much stuff and then there's mental health issues from a couple of the guys and just a, it's a crazy rabbit hole, but they made some beautiful music and it, it almost seems like Moby Grape is being a little more appreciated now more, more than ever. If you haven't heard of them, go check it out. I'm more of an audio. I have to hear it. You, have to hear it yeah. you probably have to go to YouTube because for some reason, Spotify and Apple Music, their first record is in a lot of people's critics and whatever, top 100 rock records of all time. And and certainly a top debut record. Like you'll see the whole record there at Spotify, but only like three songs will play. The other ones are grayed out. No one knows why. So you might have to go to YouTube to, to find those songs. The film industry is interesting. I've, I've worked on a few short films and a few features, but I think documentaries can really set a tone and really set a mood for what you want to listen to or what you want to understand about a subject. And while it is edited down and sometimes you can get some good raw footage, I think those are the types of documentaries that really resonate with you as a person, no matter what the subject matter is. And, you know, a good film, like a good soundtrack, just kind of can take you anywhere. Yeah, you know, we're lucky that we have that music to put into it because it's great music, you know. You know, being an Academy Award winner yourself here, and this is kind of what I was curious about because you just, how did that change your own life and your own career? Do, do you feel the loneliness from winning an Academy Award or? You know, as a songwriter, you know, I'm not Bill Medley. I'm not Jennifer Warrens. I'm not Eric Carmen. Songwriter can kind of just, you know, and that's good and bad because the songwriters kind of get the short end of the stick in the business, even though that's, they're the, lifeblood of it. What I did get out of it was I was able to stay in the business as long as I have. I'm still doing it. All this equipment behind me, I'm recording other artists and recording myself. And I couldn't ask for more really. So I, I didn't, I never had fame 
you know, my songs were famous, but I'm I'm not. I've questioned that with my wife. You know, we we talked about. It. I said, well, gee, you know, I, 2019 was my first album as an artist, and you know, that's late, <laughs> and I'm loving it. I love it absolutely. I, I never thought I would love it. I never thought of myself as a singer necessarily. She, you know, said the the good side of that is, you know, because I said, well, maybe I should have done that years ago, and she's like, well you know, your life would be different. You know, you're, you're happy. You're, you know, had you gone down that road, perhaps, you know, you wouldn't be happy. You know, the fact that you own a business, the fact that you have found people to produce their music for, what is it like discovering a new talented musician that you just want to help them become better? Well, you know, the, a, a good producer is just there to sort of bring out what's best in the artist. One of my first forays into production was with a band called Kara's Flowers. They ended up being Maroon 5. Oh, okay. So I worked with Adam Levine. Uh, they were young, they were 16. And you know, our, our job, at the time I was working with a guy named Tom Allen and he, he was living in Malibu and he heard them playing in a garage or a party or something. And, so we just brought him into the studio and the job of the producer was really just to help them focus on what they're trying to get across and what they do best. And I, I enjoy putting that hat on, you know, as, as being a songwriter, you, you know, you write in a day in and day out, it starts to get like, damn your mind a little bit, you know, and I always looked at production as a distraction for a minute, you know, oh, let me produce somebody else's music use my years, you know, I, I, I really attuned, tuned my skills at production because as a songwriter through the years, years and years ago, you could sit at a piano and, or guitar and sing a song and, you know, for an A&R guy at a record label and they go, oh yeah, that's a great song. We're going to go record that. As time went on, you had to make a recording, a production that they could go, oh yeah, this could be a hit tomorrow. This is could be on the radio and they could just pop a vocal into it, you know, to whoever their artist was. So uh, through the years of making demos for song plugging that I was doing, and I'm talking every genre really, mm. kind of um, fine tuned my production abilities. Mm. And, and I almost feel like I'm at the top of my game right now. <laughs> <laughs> Things just reveal themselves to me. I just, you know, pick up an instrument and I'm, I'm I, well, I need a guitar part in this. And, I, you know, I, it just comes again with the not really thinking, you know, there's not much thinking involved. There's just a, you hear it in your head and you put it down. I'm a pretty good bass player, but I'm not a great guitarist. I'm not a great keyboard player. I'm not a great piano player, but I can put the part across than I need to put across. Just enough to piece it all together. Just enough to piece it all together. <laughs> Again, through the years of doing it, you know, you get a feel for it, how to put it together and how to not step on the guitar part with the piano part, you know, that kind of stuff. I love it. I, I love, I'll, I have a Hammond B3 in the other room and a friend of mine just asked me to put a Hammond down on something. And, you know, once again, I, you know, I'm sitting there punching in and, trying and then punching it in again but you know i get it down to where you know you, the listener doesn't know i had to punch it in but it's sounds good to, to them do you have a favorite synth or a favorite instrument that you just always go back to well if you want to say synth i i still have that juno 106 that i wrote hungry eyes on and it's actually a keyboard that it's hard to replace um as i stated earlier a, a guy like kevin parker from tame impala uses that synth it's got a sort of a simplicity yet it's um the iconic sounds it's still an analog it's not a digital nice. it's analog synthesizer so i would say that would be my favorite i do love love the hammond the hammond organ is just beautiful i have but i have another wacky but it's really wacky it's only usable in certain things but it's from the 50s it's called a clavioline it's early synth probably it's best known was well, two really well-known uses john lennon played it with an orange 
on Baby, You're a Rich Man. If you listen on the left side, sounds like a sounds like an Indian, I don't even know what to call the Indian instrument. That sounds a little bit like a saxophone. That, and he just did it with an orange. Because it only plays one note at a time. So if you listen to Baby, You're a Rich Man, you'll hear a clavioleen on the left side. And the other usage was, I think it was The Ventures or something, or I forget the name of the song. It was one of those sort of space age sounding. That's another cool instrument. A friend of mine does audio and video production down this way, and, and he has a ton of instruments, but he has a lot more uh, 70s tape recording setups and things like that. More A lot more analog stuff than than digital, because he just loves <clears throat> the sound of it just it the can't, way. It can't be. It, yeah. it can't be. It's, it's, digital is enough samples to fool your ear, to think you're hearing the whole thing. Whereas tape is the full spectrum. It's all there. There's no fooling your ear. It's it's there. It's all there. It's not samples. Do you think the industry should go back to the analog method? I, 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 you know, I, I'm going to give my spiel. I, I don't know because modern pop music is so digital oriented and sample uh, meaning like a kick sample and a snare sample and a auto tune. And so I'm not sure, but I, I, I will say this, you still have young generation going back to the well of those records made with analog gear, you know, the, the who the Beatles, the stones, that stuff still still listened to by a young generation generations i feel and i read an article and i still can't find that article again analog imprints on your brain better than digital digital doesn't do the same imprinting to your brain the analog does maybe for the reason i said because it's a full spectrum you know they may be listening to the who or the beatles on a digital mp3 but those were recorded analog and that you know that still comes through there's that depth of sound so nothing like uh they say the classics but i just call it great music yeah i have a, there's a take a couple of tape where right there's yeah. there's a, a two track and then there's a 16 track right there 16 oh, yeah. track two inch that's what all records used to be made out of it was 24 track usually this one happens to be 16 uh, I like 16 because it each track is a little wider, uh, more information on there. So press it on vinyl. Is that even around still? Is they? Oh yeah, I my my two records are on vinyl, I have on CD, and they're also digital downloads. But I, I do I do vinyl mostly. Is it just to give you that full sound effect that you wanted? Oh, it sounds better. It's it's a whole different experience. You, you know, you put a record down. I used to come home from school. We had, a, I had a little, everybody had a little tube stereo system in their bedroom. Cause that's all they had in the early sixties. And I go lay on my bed and put a record down, stare at the album cover, you know, read all the notes on it, get up, turn it over, drop that needle. You feel the electric when you drop the needle, you feel the needle hitting the groove and the amplifier amplifying. It, it, it's like electric going through your system you know it's a it's a beautiful thing if you could take a song from the 60s 70s 80s and 90s and 2000s is there a favorite song of any of those decades that if you could just put your own mini playlist together what would it have on it uh well i go back to this pretty woman because that was the first thing that i woke like kind of woke me up i was like five or six years old i was like wow roy orbison you know is this unrequited love right he he saw this pretty woman and he she didn't bother with him she didn't notice him and then the very end there's that little hint of oh she's coming wait she's coming back she's she's so i i put that on my you know top five wichita lineman is a favorite norwegian wood must be a steely dan in that song in there somewhere tame and Paula tune uh on his earlier record i I hate to quote all these old songs, but people make the world go around by the stylistics, Strawberry Fields. I mean, there's a lot of Beatle tunes. I probably favor John's stuff more than Pete and Paul, although Paul is amazing. I guess I should mention like Peaches and Regalia, Frank Zappa. 
Well, you know, Santana did this one record called Welcome. It was when he sort of met John McLaughlin. There's a couple of songs on that record. It's stellar. Traffic, Steve Winwood. Um, I, if I have to pick a Steve Winwood, you know, uh, Can't Find My Way Home, which of course was Blind Faith, which I covered actually on my last record. Uh, brave, brave of me, but I, I did. I covered it. Slightly different, but I hope to, to do it uh, proud. I also covered another song, Morning Dew, uh, which has been covered many times by many artists. It was written in the 60s, a 60s folk song, sort of about the world <laughs> annihilation and afterwards. But Jeff Beck covered it with Rod Stewart. The Grateful Dead covered it. Uh, it's been covered many times. Omaha from Moby Grape, Fall on You, a song named He, that was on the second Moby Grape song, Wow. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm going to go with my mom. That's, you know, the sto story I told you earlier. She played piano all by ear. So I grew up around music. And, and again, that little bit of inspiration when I was seven years old playing guitar, uh, and I was in the basement and I overheard her saying, oh, he, he sounds like he'd be good on guitar. I think that was inspirational. Yeah, I, I'm going to go with my mom. From a professional standpoint, you're, of course, a very successful musician. You are now branching into your own musical style, which I, I can't wait to hear more of. And I, I look forward to seeing much more from you in the future as well. So professionally, you were successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, yes. I, I, it's, you know, I'm able to continue to keep working in this business. I feel um, that I'm putting out good records, good music into the cosmos. Uh, that's a good feeling. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't. I'm, it's almost perfect, really. It's almost perfect. It's like I, I didn't lose my soul. <laughs> I don't want for for anything really, and uh, I'm able to continue to work with different artists and, and including myself, and uh, do what I love to do. So yeah, that's about as successful as uh, I would want to be. <laughs> nice. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Well, if you're a songwriter and an, and an artist, uh, you know, it, it's like a, like being an actor. It, your rejection, songs that are rejected, you know, auditions you go to as an actor, you're rejected way more than you're successful. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. Uh, it, you know, you just keep going, you know, you you know, you can get dejected at times and, and be like, oh, man. But, you know, given a short time away from it, you're drawn back in because you love to do it so much. Uh, luckily for me, I mean, those days are sort of over because uh, now I'm able to just put out music at my whim, work with artists at my whim. And so I, I they may not be, you know, top 40 on the charts, but they have their audiences. That's all you, you can hope for, just to affect however many people it is with your music. And if you can do that amongst all that we're bombarded with. Uh, I saw that somebody downloaded one of my, a digital download, one of my records in Finland. Okay. I, I reached somebody in Finland. That's pretty cool. <laughs> love it. <laughs> it's the same for people that download the podcast. I mean, I had someone in Germany download like every single episode I'd post. I'm like, wow, that's, that's amazing. It's incredible. It's like, it feels good, right? It does. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Wow. <laughs> that's why we do it. <laughs> yeah. We want people to enjoy it. We want people to take it in. If that doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, at least I enjoyed making it. It's always nice when, you know, you, you hear of somebody, you know, loving a couple, a couple of these interview, not a couple, a little while back, I had just heard my two records and it was loved them. So, I mean, that, that feels good. 
and you put a smile on their face, I'm sure. <laughs> the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? How can they inspire? You know, I think every generation takes in what's, what's around them. Like I said earlier, you take it all in. A creative person uh, will take it all in and sort of regurgitate it out in their own way with their own spin on it. I don't worry about The only thing I worry about, uh, worry about is unless we come up with another system, the Spotify, the streaming model is not going to, not going to, can't last. You know, I, I know people now put out music so that they can do shows and live and that's where they make the money. But I think there'll always be a creative spirit. You know, there's people that are just born with a creative spirit and they're going to pursue it, get all the influences around them that they, you know, all the, their loves, their, you know, music that they love and it'll go into a, a stew in them and they'll spew it back out for us. And the next generation will listen to that and go, Oh, I love that. I'm going to, I'm going to get me some of that. And then I'm going to mix it around in my own head and, and it's going to come out, you know, different, but, but I, I have that influence, you know, well, John, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you, of course? Where are you on this wonderful world of the internet? All the artists that I work with uh, can be found on Spotify. Um, but in order, in order to know who they are, you can go to OMAD, O-M-A-D, records omad records omad records.com and you can see uh peter lewis record arwin lewis record the size robert laroche um russ dust myself um uh yeah so that's 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 the first place to go i guess to hear stuff well like i said that ends this particular episode of two geeks talk you can of course find this interview and 1200 plus others on our website tgtmedia.com or two geeks talking.com that's two the youtube channel is always updated that is youtube.com forward slash tgt media the podcast you can find at two geeks talking.podbean.com or just search two geeks talking wherever you get your podcasts and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out Thanks for listening and watching on to Geeks Talking.